Welcome to week nine. And this week we're going to be talking about markets and marketplaces. As part of what we're engaging in and exploring this week is the way in which we can distribute ideas, products or practices. And part of that is around, tied around our strategy and our strategic decision making. As I said, decisions have consequences, but the good thing is, with consequences, if nobody comes back from the future to stop, to stop you, to stop you, to stop you, I mean, if nobody comes back from the future, then how bad a decision can it be, be, be? Huh? Wait, what? Welcome to week nine. In this week, we're going to be engaging in a discussion around markets and marketplaces. And we're looking at the idea of how we use these virtual forums and virtual marketplace and virtual market space to distribute ideas and content across the internet. Huh, deja vu. Huh. Anyway, the idea that we have and we want to look into here is that a market and market space is the culmination of a consequence. So we've made a series of decisions We've looked at different platforms and opportunities, and now we're bringing it together as a, an end result of a choice. That's one of those things where consequences can be good or bad, but ultimately you're just looking for there to be consequences. Now we are coming close to the tail end of semester, and we now are heading towards the e-performance, e-marketing performance review. So we're approaching closeout. And I know that time is getting tight on your schedule, so I will try and keep this relatively straightforward. For those of you who have been running in a marketplace this semester, you will see a reaffirmation of some of your decisions and perhaps validations and justifications you can use towards the performance review. For those of you who have been considering adding in a physical, digital, or other product that is mediated through a marketplace. This could be a chance to look at expansions beyond the current project. So let's talk markets and marketplaces. Let's explore what our opportunities and possibilities are. And the first thing we want to bring your attention to is the 1990 rule. And this is the Wikipedia rule as it's better known or known colloquially. 1% of any given audience tends to be the content creator. So here we would think about that as a producer. 9% of the audience is somehow a content contributor, a person who provides material support, either in our Wikipedia's case, it was editing. On the case of other platforms, it could be things like the content creator initiates the thread, the content contributors post to the thread. But a central idea in the Wikipedia rule is that 90% is the audience. And I want to draw attention to this in so far as when we are distributing product online, we are targeting that 90%. We're targeting that audience, the people who consume the content. So they are a very valuable part. You often see the 1990 used disparagingly of, oh, God, you know, 90% are just freeloaders and lurkers. No, 90% of the market. They're the people who we get to have as an audience. And audiences are immensely valued. And I thank you for being my audience. I am content creator of a large portion of this site's experience. When you co-create, when you respond in the forums and you participate in the live learning events, you are the contributor. But for all the other things that you're doing, when you're reading those papers, you're reading the articles, you're reading the forums, you are watching these videos, you're engaged in the self-service learning, you are my audience and you are important and you are valued. And that's why the Wikipedia rule should be thought of as a way to conceptualize how valuable people are when we are looking at the distribution 
of ideas and content. So in the market to marketplace focus sites, there's a couple of key ideas associated with them. First of all is we are looking at them as wholesalers and retailers. If you are going direct to supplier, then you are routing past the market. So going back to a distribution, we have at least two layers. You have a customer who goes to an intermediary, and the intermediary is the marketplace. There are a whole bunch of different ways the marketplaces can take place, but functionally they are there to create a, an efficiency. Now, the internet does allow for disintermediated exchanges from customer to manufacturer. But the internet has also created amazingly potent intermediation where a shop front, a brokerage, or an auction house can draw customers to it and have multiple possible providers within the same space sharing that overall audience. It was kind of hard to find software for Market to Marketplace. I know the Depop uh, app, it's not desktop software per se, but it's a phone based app. Uh, Shopify is a web based app, and I know eBay's got its own phone app. But generally, Market to Marketplaces aren't an area where it's that easy to find this editing software. On the other hand, the market, the software market that exists, the Valve Games Steam Store, mentioned it a few times in the past, it gets a big run in this session because it's a very well built and well implemented wholesale mechanism and retail shop front. So overall, one of the things you want to consider is the value of the marketplace within the value proposition that you're providing. It is both a distribution channel, but it is also potentially a point of positioning, promotion, communication, access, and a value offer in its own right. One thing to consider is it's a form of product bundling where the product is the overall, the store shop front, so an Etsy that type arrangement which draws together a whole bunch of different handmade merchants creates a market space that a customer is attracted to and finds value in attending. So if you were to team up with a number of other providers and create a combined shop front, you would be creating value for the customer by those elements being seen and positioned around each other. So that enhances your brand, it enhances your overall value proposition. So think about, for your own projects, where would you see a marketplace fitting in? And we're going to split this a little bit into business to business and business to consumer. On um, a little flashback, a uh, reminder about retail distribution strategy, the fact that there are three strategies to choose from, the intensive, the selective, and the exclusive, and that these tie into product life cycle phases, and they tie into innovation adoption phases. It's also a way to start thinking about how do you want to move your content. Now I have used a relatively intensive distribution strategy for the videos. Three different possible platforms. I've used an exclusive distribution platform for the Shadow Hawker Wednesday sessions. So you can use multiple strategies at the same time. It's just a case of choosing which one will create the most benefit for you and what the consequence of that selection will be. What will it do for the other aspects of the marketing mix? For example, exclusivity implies limited, which in turn creates a position in the mind of the consumer that will support a premium pricing strategy. Hard to get, difficult to acquire, valuable, value in ownership oriented, raise the price accordingly, 
sign and number the exclusive only 100 copies available it's also why the functionally the nft is based on exclusivity driving price driving value the next way to think about this in terms of incorporating price uh, is the idea that the print on demand services use which is notionally it's free and it's all about the premium it's about the commission when they shift product they cover their costs and take a cut and you get a reward as well depending on what you set for your pricing the next way to think about it is the freemium where you charge an extra to provide additional free well, there's free product listings just for you if you happen to sell a number of products and pay a certain subscription fee etc the premium uh, by the way if you are using an Etsy store read the paperwork really carefully they've got some nasty hidden in in their premium accounts uh, one of those which is quite suspect is that if someone clicks on an ad for an Etsy product and during that transaction whilst they're at the site having followed it in from an advert they will charge anyone who sells during that session for the advertising whether they signed up to it agreed for it or were actually the beneficiaries of it so there's some really gray stuff happening in there but basically it's a premium you get additional features bonuses and elements atop working with the site uh, also you have things like uh, subscription based access to service so Shopify runs a bunch of subscription based so you need to have this is a cost calculation so this is effectively a retail shop front it's renting a retail shop front in the digital space and it can be priced around subscription model on the non-financial price side the business to business you're also looking at aspects in there where you're doing things like if you're using drop shipping so you have a retail shop front that the customer orders from you you then order in just in time ordering from a variety of uh, internationally based providers you're dependent on their shipping speeds so time delays are not yours to control or you could take ownership and buy the merchandise bring it in resell it upping the complexity upping the difficulty there are a bunch of factors behind the scenes so one of the things as a consumer of the business to business circumstance so if you're using Shopify you are Shopify's consumer if you're selling on eBay you are eBay's consumer what are the non-financial prices associated with your use of their retail service and factor those into your own operation as things that you are going to experience atop all the other aspects now distributions uh, we have things like the on-screen subscriptions where it's access to a restricted area and the YouTube join this channel the YouTube subscriptions paid elements we have the distribution of the digital tangible and the digital intangible uh, the fact that you I'm not going to get into the rant about uh, the journal articles being for profit journals are for profit entities that rip off universities students and academics in equal measure but also the fact that you can hire a PDF file for 72 hours in which you cannot print it out and it will try and lock down your screen print function so there are some nasty things out there in digital distribution of PDFs uh, we've mentioned before the idea of the 3D convertible and tangible, the printable, uh, using a retailing outlet that allows you to purchase, download, but also allows you to upload for a premium that you can then 
use their server space to serve their audience that's looking for the parts and pieces that you provide. Equally, you can do on brokerage. And this is the idea of using a, an intermediary service, for example, Shapeways. You can create the object in 3D, have Shapeways printed and handle the logistics of the distribution in return for both a cut of the action and a premium price. Same again for uh, the not terribly subtle closet uh, and their positioning strategy in terms of how they're advertising who your implied audience is. But also it's about being able to move physical objects. So you're paying for the brokerage without necessarily getting access to, you're getting the market access, but you're not, and that therefore is the market space, but you're not necessarily getting the marketplace. You still have to put things in envelopes and ship them to people. Uh, finally, distribution of the mediated and tangible. And this is the concept. Now, the Itch.io site is a games development site. It's incredibly interesting in terms of a forum that's designed to facilitate the creation of value offers. It also comes with a range of licensable and reusable elements that you can then build upon to create your value proposition. It's the ultimate prosumption operating space. Now, switching over to thinking about business to consumer from now we're acting as consumers. So the first thing we're all familiar with is price appearing as shipping cost and Amazon offering free shipping. If you are going to offer free shipping on your value offer in your project, you need to ensure that that operational cost is covered somehow. Whether it's covered in the margin that you mark up your product by, the it's covered by a sponsorship or Patreon or something else. Free shipping, free to customer is cost to producer. And that cost gets recovered. Also, there are options around free if. So the freemium is spend a certain amount of dollars with us. We will send you the product that you've just paid for by incorporating their shipping costs into the margin of the product you've already paid for. So clearly at Vistaprint, once they're hitting $60 worth of product, their margin is covering their shipping costs, their current shipping arrangements. So you start to get a sense for how much shipping costs people at what threshold they set uh, some places $150, some are at $50, some are at $75, but you get a price positioning strategy as well of at what point do you go user pays to, or user pays overtly to user pays covertly. Remembering also that all of this is going to hook back into your price positioning, price perception, total price concept and premium pricing. So this is really heavily driving distribution as a theoretical framework and what impact your distribution choices have on your price perception, which then has on the value proposition and the product position. So your selection of marketplace has a number of consequences that flow back up the channel and need to be aligned with the previous decisions that you've made. For example, here, again, Vistaprint, we know that it's about $8 to ship because once you're over $60, they'll cover your first, they'll cover the free shipping, which very clearly says that their margins, they're making more than 10 bucks, they're making more than eight bucks on a $60. Uh, yeah, you spend $60 there, they are making 
at least $52 is now a float because it's $8 for the shipping. There's $52 left in there for them to take the rest of their margins, cut and profit. However, they also offer premium speed. You can knock up to four, four to six days off your distribution charge by adding $2. Or you can knock five or more days out of the equation by spending 12 more dollars. So express shipping then also creates a, it is, becomes its own product. This is a value proposition of time versus dollar. What is it worth to me to wait an extra four days versus have it as close to now as possible. Value proposition kicks in. So you have a little product, you effectively create a product bundle through your marketplace pricing of your distribution. Uh, one of my uh, team from 2020 did actually create a number of box-based products and subscription box price based product. So if you're thinking about an entrepreneurship plan, a lot of people are spending a lot of time at home at the moment and a monthly a monthly deliverable around sort of a thematic area, particularly if you can get uh, either exclusive elements or elements that are unique in some way to your region. So a Canberra based subscription box that drew on local manufacturers and promised a broad value proposition rather than specific one shirt, one shoe, one sh sock, one hat type arrangement. But this is also interesting because this allows for a number of different pricing practices and pricing points. It also is headed towards a uh, relational, relationship oriented, turning yourself into a retailer by being the subscription box also requires you to have wholesaler level access so that as the box increases in popularity you still have capacity to service your markets. All right, thinking from a consumer's perspective, the non-financial prices that are involved in the markets and the marketplaces, time is probably the biggest non-financial price engaged. The lag between the order and shipping. You buy it off eBay and if you're in a hurry you're waiting by the post box or you have that moment where you've ordered something from an online store and life got busy then you forget about it. And a few weeks later, hey happy birthday me, I've got me a present. The reverse Secret Santa, the drunk shipping from Amazon. There's a whole bunch of different ways in which you can end up having time become a feature, but realistically time is a cost here. You walk into a store, you buy the thing off the shelf, you have it. You walk on, you go onto the internet, you buy the thing, you wait for it. So the value proposition needs to be such that the person who's waiting is getting a benefit in some other area to compensate for the time price. Uh, obviously energy and effort to purchase online is ridiculously low because you can drunk shop on Amazon. One click ordering means that you may, your customer may buy and end up with cognitive dissonance because it was too easy to buy. They accidentally bought more than they meant to. The final one I want to mention is the financial and function risks of Shopify's fake store problem. Now I've seen this on a number of occasions and I quite often will report Facebook ads for the fake stores that go to Etsy, steal a bunch of photos from an Etsy provider and then go and offer the Etsy product at a low but not too low to be ridiculous price. Where there's and if you recall, we showed a leather face hugger mask from Aliens made on Etsy. This is what got me 
alerted me to this particular practice because I already had that case study. And then I started seeing Facebook ads offering amazing Halloween mask for 50% off, $50 now. It's like, there's no way in hell that product and those images were all stolen images. Now, if you had gone to the Shopify site and got, oh, that looks, that's good value, that's a good deal, I'm going to spend my money here, and suddenly the cart disappears and the flyby nights, of which I have been ripped off by a lightsaber, buying a lightsaber online, my mistake for not buying through eBay or AliExpress. But this then puts an increased level of doubt and risk towards your next online purchase. You become less likely to want to buy from an independent merchant and more likely to want to go through a validated platform where you can at least start the fight with the platform. So if you get ripped off by a merchant on Etsy, you can take the fight up to Etsy. You get ripped off on eBay, you've got eBay as your backup. So let's talk about a couple of uh, final things in the distribution market space. Now we've mentioned Bandcamp before, but the digital intangible, the ability of a space to facilitate the transaction, I pay money, I receive goods, and the digital intangible space provides that to me. The key here is the market space is as a producer, I can put my content in, set a price for it, and the content will come out to the customer. The next place, uh, the, there are three different digital distribution shop fronts. <sighs> Besida, thanks Todd Howard. Yes, I paid money for Fallout 76 when it first came out. I've been meaning to play it, apparently it's gotten much better. But boy, did functional risk come home and bite me. But, I still maintain it was a worthwhile investment. The next up are some really interesting ideas around the marketplaces that support digital transactions, the convertible and tangible. And the idea of creating these art objects, creating these 3D objects, which you upload into a brokerage, and then that brokerage handles both file distribution and all of the accompanying transaction. So pair that as well with the ability to have physical objects and physical artifacts in place. Similarly, uh, now I make use of this particular service. As you can see, the uh, album at the top of the screen I might have made some jokes about the non-existence of CD drives and DVD drives, but I bought a physical CD, having seen it, having played the song on YouTube, used it as my case illustration to get my screenshots, and then gone, actually, I, I want to own, I want to own the album again. I, I want that. So, just about anything with Adams can be shipped through some form of brokerage. And whilst I did buy from eBay, I found what I was looking for as my original source point here through a specialist niche brokerage. This is a marketplace for selling CDs and vinyl and tapes. There's also uh, the mediated intangible. Now, for those of you who are into role-playing games, uh, there's a variety of online role-playing services, such as Roll20. Drive Through RPG is a storefront that sells component parts, digital licenses for the use of parts inside another virtual environment. Roll20 itself has a range of digital parts that you can purchase and then use within its virtual environments. So your consumer has the ability to license for on use, a very presumption way of if you're an online, a games master on an online system, you are most likely a consumer. You are consuming objects to create something for your audience of players. All right, let's close out with some case studies. 
wrapping it up on the markets and marketplaces. My favorite go-to example of a marketplace that handles niche marketing and financial transactions and some digital fee, some digital transmission. Etsy is the go-to. Uh, if you are a crafter and you make handmade materials, it's worth looking at Etsy as a retail outlet because they also attract a customer base that's looking for the broad genre of handmade or upcycled or secondhand. The next one uh, is my go-to if I want to buy from the source. There's the Alibaba business to business merchant website where minimum purchase is around like 5,000 units. Or there's the drop shipping companion site, AliExpress, which allows you to buy as a consumer, but also allows you to set up shop as a retailer. So AliExpress is a mix of storefront, wholesaler, retailer, and shopping mall. I will tell you now that once you start exploring it, you will find yourself buying the, the most interesting of things because it's very good for that co-creation of, I like that, I want one. Add to cart, purchase from this supplier. It also, if you are looking to go into drop shipping, it's probably a good place to get started to sort of practice there. And it's a good chance to go, when you see something advertised in the Facebook ad and you're like, I kind of like it, but I want to know, is it an original or is it a knockoff? Go out, look for it on AliExpress, find the source, find the master copy. Now, everyone's favorite uh, secondhand artist formerly known as a secondhand brokerage. eBay began life selling as a consumer to consumer secondhand goods market. It then betrayed the people who made it successful by bringing in a very strong business to consumer focus. And the reality is if you can buy from David Jones and Meyer and Woolworths and Coles on eBay, it's not a consumer to consumer platform. There still is a level of consumer to consumer that takes place, but I tend to, I have bought less secondhand materials in the last five to 10 years probably five years, and I used to buy, in its early days of eBay, I bought a lot of consumer secondhand goods. Uh, my parents had a long-term ongoing eBay secondhand goods as we sold off all the various things in our cupboards and collections around our house. We ran for about five years as a C2C entity and operation. That sort of wrapped up because basically the market got flooded uh, with the B2B and the B2C. So big businesses can absorb shipping costs. They can, why buy a secondhand Royal Dalton dinner set from some unknown person when you can buy it from Royal Dalton, the manufacturer, direct through eBay. So that eBay made, made a mistake there. Uh, there is now a market opening for a strong C2C franchise to come through and to create the auction house of moving parts and pieces through the economy as an upcycling uh, platform. Now, back into talking about my favorite uh, case example, I do very much love Steam as a whole of marketing concept operation. It's a product in its own right. It's a distribution channel. It handles certain pricing requirements. It has a cyber community element to it. It has a co-creation aspect to it. It also has a major gambling problem, which we've got to deal with eventually. And it is in fact a market space of data masquerading as a vending machine. But Steam isn't the only one in the game. And what you find that Steam does particularly well is the recommendation engine. The ability to go, players like you liked games like this. So what you play, your behavior helps influence what the system will recommend to you as the next product. 
It also asks you questions, which is really interesting. Uh, as a result of following Casey Explosion, the world's greatest sloth mom, on Twitter, I've had a lot more independent games come into my circle. So I've started wishlisting and adding a lot more pre-release pre independent content. And when the algorithm at Steam isn't convinced that what you're selecting is similar to what you've bought previously, it will ask you, are you sure you want to wishlist this? This doesn't seem like previous products you've purchased. By seeking that proactive confirmation, you are granting permission for it to update your profile and become more useful. So as it tries to learn who you are and what you're into and what games you like, where it's uncertain that this is a game that it would recommend you, it checks and therefore it can add that into its data set of machine learnt recommendations. Players like Steven who play MechWarrior also play Fights in Tight Spaces. Players who play Fights in Tight Spaces like card-based roguelikes. Therefore, we should recommend the following game to Stephen because it's a card-based roguelike that involves big metal robots punching each other. I mean, talk about my dream. Then we go from Steam into Epic Games. They tried. They really tried. But Epic Games virtual digital desktop is not very good. And to be polite about it, it's bloody rubbish. It shouldn't be. It should be better than it is. But it's very hard to use. It's got a clunky interface. It has no real sense of community. I can't find... I, I can find the games I want to play if I look for them directly and I know the keywords to find them or if I've come to it from some other platform. It's... Compared to Steam, it is a very primitive user face, interface. And it makes, and Bethesda's software makes it look like gold and magic and unicorns with recommendation engines. Because you click the buy button in Bethesda's desktop software, it will take you to their website. It will open a browser take you away from their software package and into a transaction based in a website. Steam can do the whole thing in-house in the one software package. Epic can do it mostly in-house in the one software package and these guys can't even get the basic of a PayPal transaction right. So there is a sliding scale. Some market spaces are better than others. All right, let's close out with the theory and application. This is bringing back Etsy into uh, a quick bit of discussion around the idea of Etsy as a platform to support a particular style of commerce. And here this paper talks about uh, the notion of slow fashion and ethically sourced sustainable production. So what you can use this is, this is a very good example of how a niche can find a home in a distribution channel that adds authenticity to that niche. Because the Etsy channel is predominantly about the authentic, handmade, small batch run, artisanal, hand produced, these Providers of raw materials, these functionally business-to-business -business providers, creators of, you know, in this case, it was yarn and fiber. By positioning themselves in Etsy as handmade raw material, they drill the authenticity of the Etsy platform and their own authenticity of slow production which they then facilitated through secondary channels like Instagram of demonstrating, showing the work behind the scenes, showing the authenticity of their small farms where they were shearing half a dozen alpaca 
to turn out their 30 or 40 skeins of alpaca wool or whatever the hell it is that they did with alpacas and wool and fiber because it was off like it's absolutely awesome it's genius to take a small hobby farm lifestyle brand and turn it into a niche sustainability driven authentic product offering because there's a huge value offering for that and you can premium price it because it's a niche market of exclusivity with limited supply runs using an exclusive distribution channel and a positioning strategy of authenticity and as we know from brands and brand communication authenticity has a strong resonance in key markets so if you need me the channels upon which you can find me is Wattle, our retail outlet for experience, direct through the email or over the socials, mediated over the socials, however it is you need to get in touch. I know that we're heading into a high pressure period. Consultations will be available. And look, as you go to close out your assignments and you're getting into the stressful end of the proceedings, please reach out early. If you're hearing this message and it's coming up on deadline, get and you find it to be all too much, I'd rather we started the conversation early. I'd rather hear from you and see what I can do to support and help you than to leave it to the last minute or have a post deadline. Oh no, I couldn't, I, I didn't get there. Reach out, contact us, talk to us. Let us be part of the way in which it gets better. Don't think of us as your barriers and your enemies. Think of us as your allies and your ways to improve circumstances and situation. It's 2021. It's been a weird year. You're coming into the tail end of second semester. It's been a long cycle. There's been a lot of things happen. We're here to back you up. We're here to help you because I want to see you succeed. And I want to let you know that you just reach out, you talk, you send us the email, you make the comms channel open, and we will support you. And with that, see you in the next episode.